Lord, do it for me. Anybody's testimony this morning, your prayer. Lord, do it. Lord, do it for me. Historic First Baptist. Good morning to everyone that is tuned in online. Good morning to everyone that is here in person. Are y'all excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? For truly this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. Come on, let's stand all over the building. Let's stand all over the building. And let's worship the Lord together. He deserves, desires, and demands our praise. And let's welcome Pastor Patrick as he comes and leads us in worship. How many of y'all glad that you got Jesus this morning? I said, how many of y'all glad that you got Jesus? Come on, let's worship him together. Yeah, how's everybody doing this morning? We hope you're doing good. It is good to be able to be in the house of the Lord this morning. God has blessed us with another beautiful day. So we want to say something to you. And we want you to search your hearts and know that if you ain't got no other friend in this world, you got Jesus. Wait, wait, what we said, fellas? Look at him. We said, glad. Oh, glad I got Jesus. Glad I got Jesus in my heart. Glad I got Jesus. Glad I got Jesus in my heart. Let's say it again. Glad I got Jesus. I got Jesus. Do you have Jesus? 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 I got J
Do you have Jesus? I got Jesus. Do you have Jesus? I got Jesus. Mama had Jesus. 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 I got Jesus. Dad 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 had Jesus. I got Jesus. Grandmother had Jesus. I got Jesus. Grandmother had Jesus. I got Jesus. Grandmother had Jesus. In my heart, yeah, I got Jesus. Down in my heart, oh man, I got Jesus. ships of Tarsus, scattered by a powerful east wind. We had heard of the city's glory, but now we have seen it ourselves. The city of the Lord of Heaven's armies, it is the city of our God. He will make it safe forever. O oh God, we meditate on your unfailing love as we worship in your temple. As your name deserves, O oh God, you will be praised to the ends of the earth, and your strong right hand is filled with victory. Let the people of Mount Zion rejoice. Let all the towns of Judah be glad because of your justice. Go, inspect the city of Jerusalem. We, go rock, we walk around and count the many towers. Take note of the fortified walls and the towers all, all of the citadels, that you may describe them to the future, the future generations, for that is what God is like. He is our God forever and ever, and he will guide us until we die. New Testament scripture will be coming from Galatians, Chapter 
six. And I'll be reading verses one through ten. Dear brothers and sisters, if another brother is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burden, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Pay careful attention to your own works, for then you will get the sat satisfaction of a job well done, and you, will, you won't need to compare yourselves to anyone else. For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for the, their teachers, sharing all things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock God. The, you cannot mock the justice of God. He will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will, will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So, let not, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, he will reap the harvest of blessings if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. This is the word of God. Come on, let's clap our hands for the word of God. Can anybody testify this morning that you've come this far by faith? And that's leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word. Why? Because he has never failed us yet. Can anybody testify to that this morning? That the Lord has never failed you. And I come to declare and decree that he never will. Come on, let's worship the Lord together. We've come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord, trusting in his holy word, he never failed. We come this far, we come this far.
you come this far by faith, come on, clap your hands over the building and let's give God a praise. responsibilities that we as a church have deemed necessary and needed for us as we give in this new year as we become better disciples. This is the third Sunday which was normally tagged along our envelopes as well as in our verbiage as missions and benevolence. You'll see in the coming months that that line item will change to missions and mercy. 
again in that area when you give to missions and to mercy they're going to place on the screen we're going to be specifically giving into these veins you can screenshot it if you want to and that is community engagement and outreach our missions ethiopia our missions honduras and our mission uganda those are the places that god has allowed our ministry to reach and to touch and to support and so when you give it to missions you're giving it to missions both locally and foreign when you see community outreach and engagement, we again give into our local school life. We support, again, our area Jackson Madison County school system as it relates to working with children who are homeless and who are without and providing food, providing clothing, sometimes providing shelter. We work also in partner with our social services ministry as they do greater outreach. They already have outreach in their ministry or resources, but we try to do greater work each year. So when you give on today, and I asked on Wednesday night that you be specific. Normally when most people give, they give and they put uh, everything on one line. And then they say, you make the decision about the delineation. I need you, when you give via envelope or give online, I need you to designate that this is the amount for time. This is the amount for offering. This is the amount for vision. This is the amount for missions and for mercy. Amen. Our desire is to make sure that each of those dollars and resources that we've committed go to those areas responsible. Remember, when we give for vision, we already determined and shared for 2024 those spaces that it will significantly impact among others. Now that we're talking about missions and mercy, one Sunday a month, 12 Sundays in the year, we ask that if you can, at minimum, above your tithes and offerings on those Sundays, those third Sundays, to give at least $5. This allows us over the course of the year, I believe five times 12 is what? Y'all can add. $60. Thank you so much. I appreciate your addition. You didn't go to school here, did you? Uh, $60, right? So <laughs> I wait on somebody to say something. Nobody said nothing but Mario. Uh, but again, $60, $60. And so $60 a year allows us as a community, if at least 200 of us participate in this opportunity, we're able to give 12000 per year. This again funds the resources of our missions and our community engagement as a whole. And so we're asking for everybody to, again, participate above and beyond your tithe. If you're able, voluntarily, it's about equal sacrifice, not about equal giving. Amen? So if you can't give the five, give what you can. If you want to give more, you can give more. That's your choice, all right? But what we want to do is continue to make impacts into the lives of the people that surround us. We can't be a church in the community and never engage the community. Are you all listening to me? Our responsibility is to be Christ-like disciples in this community, and whatever Christ has commanded of us, that's what we ought to participate in. We're not just the church that feeds the hungry, just the church that clothes the naked. That's a part of what we do, but we are the church that God has called together to call people out of darkness into the marvelous light, and one of the ways he allows us to make an impact is by putting food on tables, shelters over heads, and clothes on backs. Amen? So let's do that. Let's do that as a family. Everybody ready to give? If you're online, and we look forward to you partnering with us on this morning, information is being placed on the screen so that you can give faithfully and responsibly with us on today. You can simply scan the QR code or you can go to either one of the giving platforms or you can even mail your donation to the church. The address is there so that you can be a part of this time of giving. And remember, when you give electronically, make sure you designate in those specific places where you want your resources to go. Come on, let's grab our devices and pray together. We know that the Lord loves what? A cheerful giver. So let's give lovingly and cheerfully on today. Father, thank you so much for every giver. 
and every gift. Now, Lord, we pray that these gifts be used for the advancing, the furthering of your kingdom right here on earth. We thank you, God, for the opportunity to participate in this work. Now, so strengthen us, we pray, to be proper distributors of your resources. And we'll be careful to give you praise. All glory indeed belongs to you. This is our prayer. These are your gifts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, for those of you who are giving physically in the sanctuary, in the side sections, would you stand? For those of you online, you can participate even now. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, he is good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, yes, Those of you in our middle section, those of you in our middle section are giving physically, would you stand and come around to the front? Yes, he is good, for he is worthy. For he is good, yes, he is good. For he is worthy, worthy. For he is good, yes, he is good. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's celebrate our God. And let's thank God for, for the, even the opportunity to worship. I'm going to tell you up front. Uh, don't match my energy. I need y'all to uh, be a little bit more excited. That'll help me be a little bit more energetic. And the reason why is because today I need you more than you probably need me as I gain strength to preach over these next two services. It's been a busy week. It's been an exhausting week. It's been a tiring week. And I'm feeling the weight of these weeks together. And so even as I stand, I'm moving at the same time. And so I need to make sure that I be patient and pause and do the best that I can to get this gospel into your hearing so that we can be better disciples. And so I ask for your prayers as we prepare to pre preach the sermonic uh, presentation for today. It'll come from Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Our, our videography team is going to come now with a black history moment that has been provided by our children and our youth ministry, and then our male chorus is going to lead us. Amen? Come on, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate our, our men as they share on today, but before them, let's see this presentation as provided by our children and youth. Everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, praise the Lord is a command. And when you say, when someone say praise the Lord, you should come back and say hallelujah, because that's praising God. So we want to praise God today because why? He smiled on us. He set us free. God is our everything. He rained down from heaven all of the blessings that we need. He woke us up this morning. Thank the Lord. God has smiled on me. He has set 
we celebrate the God who has smiled, who smiled on us. He has indeed been, he's been real good to us. Amen. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. Proverbs chapter 31. I want to begin reading at verse 8. It's already, it's already going to be a heavy lesson, so y'all lighten up. Amen. Are y'all listening to me? It's already going to be a heavy lesson. Y'all lighten up. Amen. If I could hold my head up long enough to put it in print, y'all can stay up long enough to hear it. I pray. Amen. Lighten up. Wake up. Let's enjoy the day that God has gifted us. Amen. 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 Do we need to turn the heat off and turn the air on? I mean, all right, I just want to make sure. I want y'all to be around here nodding on me while I'm trying to give you this great prophetic word I believe the Lord has for us. Amen. Proverbs chapter 31, two verses, verses 8 and 9. Hear these words from the New Living Translation. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless see that they get justice. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. I want to add this one last prayer to our series short prayers for the new year that we might pray throughout the rest of this year, specifically in this Lenten season. Lord, help us to speak up for the justice of these. Lord, help us to speak up for the justice of these. This word, help, again, can be defined as to give or provide what is necessary to accomplish a task or to satisfy a need. It can also be defined as to contribute strength or means to. Also to render assistance to or to cooperate effectively with. Lord, help us to speak up. This combination of words, speak up, means to make one's position known, to assert, to come up or come out with, to declare, to let your voice be heard, to say something loud and clear, to stand up for or to speak out about Lord help us to speak up for the justice. This word justice being the quality of being just, more specifically in our text, it means right or righteousness, the equitableness or moral rightness. It is synonymous with words or phrases like fairness, due process, fair treatment, honesty, integrity, more importantly, this word, truth. Lord, help us to speak up for the justice of these. I like this pronoun. This pronoun is used to indicate one or two or more persons' things referring to the one nearer in place, time, or thought as opposed to that. Lord, help us to speak up for the justice of these. 
It was Reinhold Niebuhr, the American theologian and ethicist, who said, man's capacity for justice makes democracy possible, but man's capacity for injustice it was, is what makes democracy necessary. In the Antarctic summer of 1908 and 1909, Sir Ernest Shackleton and three companions attempted to travel to the South Pole from their winter quarters. They set off with four ponies to help carry the load. Well, weeks later, their ponies dead, rations all but exhausted, they turned back towards their base, their goal having not been accomplished. Altogether, they had tracked 127 days. On the return journey, as Shackleton records in the heart of the Antarctic, the time was spent talking about, of all things, food. They spent time talking about elaborate feasts and gourmet delights and sumptuous menus. As they staggered along, suffering from dysentery, not knowing whether they would survive, every waking hour was occupied with the thoughts of eating. Family, may I pause here to lift Early the voice of our Christ who knew the ravages of food deprivation when he said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That word righteousness in that line means justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after justice. Family, now can't we much better understand Shackleton's obsession with food? It offers to us, doesn't it, a glimpse into the passion that Jesus intends for us to have today in our quest for righteousness, in our pursuit of justice. Beloved, can I submit, without much wise contradiction, this morning, that we are, as believers, in a most opportune time for the gospel as disciples of Christ. Hear me again. Can I submit without much wise contradiction that we as believers in this present age are in a most opportune time for the gospel as disciples of Christ? I hear you. Amidst the growing rhetoric of our dysfunctional parliamentary displays, the time has never been righter or riper for us to be a witness, to be witnesses, his witnesses to the rest of the world of what the just God that we serve and what real and proper justice should look like for even the least of these. Church, this is what this mother is entrusting to her son in the closing chapter of the book of Proverbs family after all the wisdom imparted through this book the writer closes now with words to a king king lemuel just as he opens with words to a king king solomon in the opening chapter the highlighted voice then was his father that was accompanied by the words from the mother. But in this closing chapter, we have only the words of a mother, the queen perhaps, to this now adult and ready to rule a son. Beloved, she begins this 31st chapter of Proverbs with two warnings and then gives to him a highest practice a primary responsibility that he must never allow to be dismissed from his rule these would be the standards she would share that should and that would mark your reign number one is a warning against easy women number two is a warning against strong drink and number three is our consideration for this morning, the active everyday pilgrimage towards being just 
as we undertake the good fight for justice for the least of these. Listen to those words anew. You don't believe me. They're found in Proverbs chapter 31. We'll begin reading at verse 7, verse 1 rather this time, 1 through 7, as they give us insight and content for our context. Listen to it. These are the sayings of King Lemuel contain this message which his mother taught him. O oh, my son, O oh, son of my vows, do not waste your strength on women, here it is, on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, O oh, Lemuel, to guzzle wine. Rulers should not crave alcohol for if they drink they may forget the law and not give justice to the unpressed. Alcohol is for the dying and wine for those in bitter distress. Let them drink to forget their poverty and remember their burdens no more family, this, this wise mother, this possible queen who is also a mother sees her son coming of age and about to take the helm of the kingdom to rule over the lives of others who will be a significant guiding voice and deciding influence in the affairs of those people. She tells her son these things, possibly in private or maybe at the ceremony of crowning the coronation. Son, be careful not to give your time or waste your time on women, theirs who ruin kings. Son, in essence, and let me add daughters this morning for this sermonic presentation, don't ruin your lives on clout chasers. Stop letting people come up at your expense. Don't attach yourself to those who will drain you of your purpose and strip you of your energy and then rob you of the opportunity to rule well. Son, and might I say, daughter, don't do it. You don't have to lower your standards for a like when love is available. And son, don't let wine, daughter, don't let wine, don't let strong drink, strong drink rather, be your undoing. She says, don't crave it, which suggests an intense desire. Don't ache for alcohol. Don't allow it to rule you. This beverage to suppress your sinking, which will lead to the oppression of the very people that you have been called to serve. In essence, son or daughter, don't drink so much that you are no longer in control of your own faculties to the point where you must be led or that it is leading you. Your place in life is too important, son. Your place in life is too important, daughter. Your mission in life is too grave for you not to be sober in mind. Too many are counting on you to be fair. Son, daughter, wine is for those who are dying, she says. In setting of our text, the wine, ladies and gentlemen, was most often used more than water. So wine was used as an anesthesia or even an anesthetic for those who were sick and those who were dying. It was their painkiller of the time. It was also given to those who were in poverty to drink so that they could have some relief from the pressure of the troubles that they were going through. But you who have been given responsibility, she says, it's not okay for you to guzzle wine, but you can drink it. Just don't guzzle it. Don't take shots to the head to see who can't handle their liquor first. You are too important to the lives of men and women for this to be the game that you play. After this, the mother gives to her son this responsibility that does not just fall at his feet, but sits at the feet of you and I today 
in the place of what we would call democracy where your voice and your vote counts. Listen to verse 8 and 9 again. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. She says, son, you're about to take the helm of the kingdom and your responsibility above all else is to make sure you take care of the least of these. It's in the text. Look at it. This mother says to him and to us that we have a responsibility first to speak up, to seek justice for those who are muted. It's in verse 8. Here it is. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Church, this mother says simply, son, you have been tasked in this role with the responsibility to speak up more literally spoken in the text to open your mouth for those who cannot speak for themselves. This word muted carries other definitions such as those who are silent, those who are dumb, those who are speechless. Son, as king, as ruler, one who has a voice, one that cannot be hushed, it is your job to open your mouth for those who have been muzzled, these who have been decreased in volume, them who live on the margins of society. Church, can I tell you that this is not just the responsibility of them who in this country are elected to an office of representation but it is also our responsibility to speak up to open our mouths when we see justice not being properly meted out for all we have the duty to engage our community and our culture with truth and with right when wrong rears its head we must do this with the burden of those who cannot speak for themselves on our minds and on our shoulders. We must speak for a child who does not yet understand what the absence of their history history of other cultures mean. Can I tell you why? It's not an issue for the majority culture that their history be taught is because all we have learned from our inception is their history to the detriment of a balanced community. We're so bent on having to have and not have in this country that we don't understand the dangers that we're putting our country and our world in by imbalancing the education of our children. Reverend Dr. Martin King Jr., that preacher and prophet not just civil rights leader once stated a riot is the language of the unheard and I still agree with his words after that statement and those are these and what America has failed to hear it has failed to hear that the plight of the Negro poor has worsened still over the last 12 to 15 years and ladies and gentlemen that was over 40 years ago and here we are today and the gap has still not shortened when it comes to wealth in our society the second the second this mother tells her son second thing this mother tells her son I'm in the text I'm in the Bible it is speak up seek justice for those who are oppressed here it is verse 8 speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves ensure justice for those being crushed you remember that book if they hadn't banned it yet it's called to kill a mockingbird by by harper lee atticus finch is a lawyer in the american south who defends tom robinson a black man wrongfully accused of assault. Society is against Atticus, though, and he knows before he takes the case that he will most likely not succeed, but he sees a righteous act of justice that needs to be done, and he applies his personal strength and integrity to see it through. 
We know that the case, because most of us read the book, we know that the case is decided against Tom Robinson, and Tom's end is tragic. But Atticus has given the townspeople and his own children an example of pursuing what true justice is. Church, this mother shares with her son that justice is to ensure, to make secure, to make certain, to nail down, to establish for those who are being crushed help. She literally says, you need to fight for and uphold the rights of those who are, here's the word, vanishing. Those who are passing away, more literally the text means those who are mortal. You ought to fight for justice for those who are of the human kind. Child of God, we as Christian disciples are under obligation to guard and guarantee justice for those who are being oppressed. I like this word oppressed. Here's what it means. Those who are being burdened with cruel or unjust impositions or restraints. The reason why I like it because it's a clear definition. Them that are subject to a burdensome or harsh exercise of authority and power. Family, it is our task. Hear me. As the church not to just speak to spiritual oppression, but to also speak to social oppression, to also speak to economic oppression, to also speak to mental oppression, to also speak to emotional oppression. I, I, I hear in the book of Job, you remember that famed book, you remember that book where we get naked, I came be from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. But if you go to chapter 29, you'll find these words in verses 12 through 17 as he reminisces during his time of testing. He says, all who heard me praised me. All who saw me spoke well of me for I assisted the poor in their need and the orphans who required help. I helped those without hope and they blessed me and I caused the widow's hearts to sing for joy. Everything I did was honest. Righteousness covered me like a robe and I wore justice like a turban. I served as eyes for the blind and feet for the lame. I was a father to the poor and a sister strangers who needed help. I broke the jaws of the godless oppressors and plucked their victims from their teeth. Church, this man who was the richest in all of the land of us says that we must speak up individually and collectively for those who are being oppressed. Our children ghettos that we did not create. Our children who are already in underfunded school systems while those who govern the resources send their children to some of those other private places and then have the nerve to further exasperate the problem by taking the public funds to provide private vouchers. Our children need us to speak up because they are being unknowingly oppressed. Why not take those same funds and increase the teachers and administrators' salaries, thus giving every educator a reason to wake up and be free to live and work and teach all of our children towards a proper education? I guess our ancestors' feelings weren't hurt when you created single parent homes for the purpose of disenfranchising a whole group of people knowing how essential the home was as you preached in your ivory towers that distorted and dysfunctional interpretation of the gospel that you then and still now call the truth as you wrap your flag around the cross can I tell you that in this year of disciples that we have been called to be voices that speak up, that open our mouths for the oppressed. I, I hear King again 
two separate quotes. You don't mind if I use the preacher because everybody loves to use the civil rights leader. Uh, when he said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And ladies and gentlemen, we are in the greatest of times of opportunity, but also challenge and controversy to the truth. He also went on to say, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful world words and actions of those bad people but the appalling silence of the good people we have been given the charge and the task to speak up and speak out and how dare we remain quiet I'm done but this mother charges us in one last in one last way and that is this she says speak up I'm in verse 9 Seek justice for those who are stricken with poverty. Those who are stricken with poverty. Yes, verse 9, speak up for the poor and helpless and see, watch this, that they get what? Justice. Church, we are to speak up for, to open our mouths to defend the rights of the poor and the helpless those who are the afflicted and the needy those who are needing our help in being delivered from trouble and we are to see that they get justice these are these are who we would term as the beggars even those who must avail themselves to the use of governmental resources, which have always been and are always supposed to be a part of the societal structure because that's what the Lord commanded. It's amazing how, again, we want to reduce the system of care for the least of these. But when you needed it, during the time the government was shut down, it was so highly efficient. I hear the writer of Leviticus calling our attention to chapter 19, verse 15. You know that chapter that begins with these words that the Lord gave to Moses. I'll just read verse 1. It said, give these instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And then he would go on to verse 15 to say this. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge fairly. In other words, he says, God does, don't be gaming the system or stacking the deck for either group, the poor or the rich. Eugene Peterson in his message Bible translation shares these verses in this way. Speak up for the people who have no voice, for the rights of all, the downtrodders and down and outers. Speak out for justice. Stand up for the poor and destitute. I hear Jeremiah because you need scripture. You think I'm making it up in chapter 22, verse 13, concluding at verse 16, where God speaks about King Jehoiakim. He says these words, and the Lord says, what sorrow awaits Jehoiakim? who builds his palace with forced labor. He builds injustice into its walls, for he makes his neighbors work for nothing. He does not pay them for their labor. He says, I will build a magnificent palace with huge rooms and many windows. I will panel it throughout with fragrant cedar and paint it with lovely red. But a beautiful cedar palace does not make a great king, God says. Your father, Josiah, also had plenty to eat and drink, but he was just and right in all of his dealings. That is why God blessed him. He gave justice and help to the poor and needy and everything went well for him. Isn't that the Lord says what it means to know me to give justice to everybody? Church, we have a responsibility. Hear me. I'm done. As Christ's representatives to live a life out loud for justice. We have never been given
given the option of not speaking up and speaking out in those ways that we have been uniquely gifted to do so in those spaces that we have been so uniquely gifted to serve. We must each do our part. Are y'all listening to me? In our places, wherever they may be, to stand whenever and wherever we are given the opportunity to speak when we encounter injustices. It was Dr. Rabbi Yashilis who said that the ability to connect and support the concealed is not a distraction from tradition, but rather a powerful actualization. When people have been muted, when people have been silenced, when people have been set aside, and they are considered invisible, it is our responsibility. It's in our tradition. It's not a distraction to the church nor to us as individual citizens in the life of this country. It's a duty that we speak up and that we speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. Family, everybody, hear me. I understand so that I can help you. Everybody's not the podium speaker but you can be the boardroom spokesperson. Everyone is not the political rhetorician, but for those in the arena, we need to be speech makers at our corners. Wherever you sit or stand, you are to be the mouthpiece of justice. Can I tell you why? He or she that has received justice in any way ought to want to share justice in every way. I know, I know, I know some of y'all thinking about I ain't been to court, I ain't never been on trial, nothing like that. That ain't what I'm talking about, so y'all missing it. Let, let me see. Here's what the old preacher used to say back in the country. He died. Didn't he die? Y'all, y'all, y'all remember when he said that? I believe he was calling to remembrance again Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7. We always preach this during Christmas, but hear it again. For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of Heaven's armies will make this happen. Which means that the Christ who was to come and the Christ who has came has come to bring justice to earth and as his disciples and representatives we ought to reflect that justice. Some people don't like that type of preaching since they graduated to a greater sense of intellect. But I never want to be so intellectual that I lose the rhythm of my heritage, the song of those who have gone before me. He died. Didn't he die? But early Sunday morning. Can I tell you what God was not when he rose? Can I tell you what God was not when Jesus died? Can I tell you what God was not when the Holy Spirit came? God wasn't fair with us. Because if God were fair with us, if he had a meted out justice, you and I would not be here today. But because he sent his son who died and because we have the indwelling person of the Holy Spirit, his sacrifice is made anew and fresh in us every day. So we can understand that we've been given justice and we ought to share justice. How dare you feel the glory of his presence? How dare you receive the justice and mercy of his life sacrificed and lived? How dare you enjoy eternity on the way and watch your fellow man suffer in pain, in poverty, and in stress when you have a voice that can help lift the weight. So speak up. Speak out. God is calling you to be his mouthpiece. 
y'all know me. I tell y'all every time. He ain't calling you to be no party mouthpiece. He's calling you to be his mouthpiece. It's only one party, God's. Now, you can attach yours to his, but you can't attach him to yours. <laughs> Y'all will get that later. God has no party. So stop being duped by whatever political rhetoric you want to hear and understand that God has one party. That's himself. He's the whole party all by himself. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And his justice should be meted out by those who say that they are his children. Which means that there will be times when we will be considered the outcast because we don't go along. Because we don't vote the same. Because we don't participate in what the streamline or main line may say is right knowing that it kills still those who live on our streets yeah I'm pro second amendment that's the one with the gun right but you need some laws that govern the space so that we don't have them flooding our communities, killing our children. When the response time, and you can log it, you can go to the station, to our communities are minutes to hours less than the response time to others. When it's so easily trafficked in our space, but all of a sudden there's a clamp down on your area. And ladies and gentlemen, we have to do our part as well. That's why I said we are the mouthpieces because you can't point at the hall without pointing at your home. Lord, help us. Help us to speak up and to speak out for justice for these. Father, we, we thank you now. It's a weight that some don't like to carry. It's a weight possibly that all don't like to carry. Because in a world where we want to be liked, in a world where we desire more power than your presence, we have suffered the kingdom in some areas. And in suffering the kingdom, we've suffered our brothers and sisters. We've settled on this side say forget everybody else and allow them to fight for themselves but today afresh and anew I hear you calling us back to the table as a church and as a community to speak up for for these to speak out justly for these not to shade anything not to look over anything not to undercut anything not to gain the system, but to be responsible in how we view the work you've called us to. So today, God, we want to be those who speak out to the injustice of sin as well as the injustices of segregation, the injustices of those who would hinder our spiritual awareness in Sunday school and in regular school. Our desire, Lord, is your desire. And that is that everybody has fairness and an opportunity at life and life more abundantly. Now, we understand that life and life more abundantly is not like everybody else. Our capacities are different. But help us to recognize those spaces, be honest in those spaces, and be faithful to our cause. God will be careful to give you praise knowing that all glory indeed belongs to you. Now there's one who may not be saved, who heard this word, who desires to be saved. We pray for their salvation. There may be one who's saved, but who's not a part of the fellowship, and we invite them today to be a part of this ministry where they can grow, develop, and be nurtured, and be shepherded. Shepherded by you, and then allowed to be shepherded by me as I shepherd them on your behalf, earthly in this space. God will be careful to give you praise for how you allow us to pray with our brothers and sisters even today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
Listen, the door to our Father's house is open. If you're not saved, you need to be saved. If you're saved, you need to belong somewhere. We offer Christ to you, my brother, my sister. Information is being placed on the screen, ladies and gentlemen. It's as simple as sending us an email, going on our website or our app, calling the church, or scanning that QR code, and you can become a part of the body of Christ. We'll talk you through the plan of salvation. Or you can become a part of the fellowship of the church if you're already saved. And if you desire to be saved and be a part of the church, we invite you to come at this time. We offer Christ to you, my brother, my sister. We offer Christ to you, yeah, yeah. oh, my brother. We offer Christ to you. Oh, my sister, and he will give you brand new life, give you life abundantly, so come, come on, come on to Christ. Come on to Christ. Come on, let's put our hands together and celebrate those who would receive salvation in Christ and those who would receive fellowship in the body of Christ. Amen. Our desire always is to make sure that you're in right space and right standing with the Lord as you fellowship with other believers. Listen, we're getting ready to leave this place. Don't forget. This is still our year of discipleship. We just kicked it off. Again, remember, our goal is for every member to do what? Disciple at least one person a month. One person a month. You ought to share Christ with and then you ought to walk with them for at least one month to a year. Discipleship is not just getting them saved. Discipleship is walking with them, allowing them to see you live out what you say you are. And so we want to be disciples this year and better at being disciples require us to be disciplers, all right? Don't forget our academy, Christian Academy, uh, begins right after worship here in the sanctuary for our adults, for our children in the educational area. And then don't forget this Wednesday, this Wednesday we will not be in Bible study, we will be in worship together, in worship together. The Browns Creek District Association is having its service of installation in its first quarterly conference. I'm being elected second term, and so this is our service of installation on this coming Wednesday at 6.30. Uh, Dr. Christopher B. Davis, who is the interim president of Lamorne Orange College, but also the president of our state convention, Tennessee Missionary Baptist Education Convention, will be our guest preacher. All of our churches are coming together in this space to worship together and to celebrate our, our God together and these next years of service to our community and to our culture as we serve our churches. Amen. So we look forward to that on this coming, this coming Wednesday. Also, our state convention, the western half, is meeting in Brownsville, Tennessee at the historic Woodlawn Baptist Church under the leadership of Pastor James T. Farmer, who is also our Western Region Vice President. So on Monday night and Tuesday night, our state convention will be in Brownsville in service together. Amen? Amen. How many of you are fasting from something? Amen. From something. Amen. Great, great, great. I told you, if you don't, if you don't want to, if it's not your thing, you, I don't want you to do it if you're not going to be committed to it, all right? And so I'm learning how to be committed myself. I'm wrestling with this lack of television time, but we're praying. We're praying about it. Also, thank you for registering for our WT Web Leadership School. I need you to continue to register throughout, throughout the year. Amen. Birthdays, birthdays, birthdays. Anybody celebrating a birthday this week? In the sanctuary? Stand, stand. All right. Stand? Nobody? All right. We do know that there are a few. Uh, Sangster, Miss Sangster, uh, Miss Elise Hawkins, uh, Bailey Yarbrough, Erica Foote, Justin Page Robinson, and Miss Felicia Forrest is celebrating birthdays this week. Amen. So we celebrate them that are celebrating birthdays this week. We pray God's blessings over their, their lives. Come on, let's stand together. Look this way, let me, let me bless you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to smile upon you and be gracious.
gracious unto you. May the Lord lift the light of the countenance of his presence upon you and give you his peace in your laughter and in your leisure, in your frustration and even in your tears until we shall all one day sit at the feet of Jesus where there is no sunrise or sunset. Listen, God bless y'all. I love y'all. Have a great rest of your week. I'll see you on Wednesday at 12 noon for our Senior Wednesday. Amen. All of our seniors know Senior Wednesday every third Wednesday or I'll see you at 6.30 for our installation service. Amen. Be blessed.